Welcome to the Dr. Bungo Podcast. This is episode 132. We are uh, wrapping up another month here. May is pretty much done. Um, by the time this podcast airs, it will be June. And I can't believe it. School year is coming to an end. Um, you know, summer has unofficially begun last weekend with Memorial Day. Um, and it feels great here in New York. It's really nice and warm and sunny. And it uh, just feels like, you know, we are living in summer. So that's very, very beautiful right now. It's a beautiful place to be. Um, I love, I actually live in Long Island, but I work in New York City and Long Island, mostly New York City. Um, but this is the best time of year to be here. So the next few months are absolutely wonderful here in beautiful Long Island. And, uh, you know, the city, I love the city in the summer too. So it's a, it's a good time to be a New Yorker. So with that, um, let's get to the content of this podcast. So this week I've been actually thinking a bunch about, um, well, a, a bunch of things, but I've really been thinking a lot. And this come, there's a couple of reasons why I've been thinking about these things. So I've been thinking a lot about like standardized tests and uh, college admissions and med school admissions. And the reason why is my oldest child is wrapping up her junior year of high school. So we're, you know, getting ready to put our college lists together. And, you know, it's been a big topic of conversation around the house. Um, and, um, you know, coincidentally, like one of my buddies who's a doctor sent me an article about, you know, the UCLA School of Medicine and how it's been kind of like declining in the rankings over the course of the last couple of years. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, well, according to this article, and again, I, 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 you always have to consider the source of the article that you're reading. But it was more along the lines of they were letting in like lower caliber academic talent into the school. And that kind of translated into poor performance during medical school and then, you know, poor entrance into, you know, the more competitive residency programs, et cetera. Uh, but I'm going to talk about all of this in the podcast and I'll put it all in context. So, um, so, so again, explain to you the reason why I'm thinking about all of this stuff, but I kind of did a little bit, you know, it's an interesting topic for me for you know, various reasons. Um, you know, mostly because, you know, my daughter is about to go through this process and, you know, I've been reading like any article I see, you know, there's always articles in the New York times, et cetera, about, you know, which school is now, um, uh, requiring all of their students to submit an SAT or ACT score. Um, and, you know, what ha what happened was around the time of the pandemic and even before the pandemic, a few of the schools and a few of the, you know, competitive schools dropped the requirement for standardized testing. So the kids that were applying to these schools didn't need to submit an ACT or SAT score, which historically has been, you know, a big barometer for who gets into, you know, which caliber school. Um, and then, you know, during the pandemic, more and more schools dropped the requirement for standardized testing because there was just like limited access to resources. You know, everything was shut down. Schools were shut down, et cetera. I mean, you know, kids couldn't get together to take the tests, you know, because we were all socially distancing. Um, and now slowly the tide is really turning. Like, you know, like most of the competitive schools now are requiring standardized testing again. And, um, and it, it's interesting. So MIT, which is a you know, very, very, very difficult school, super competitive, you know, the kids that go there are you know, absolute you know, geniuses. They they were test optional for a very, very short period. And they were one of the first elite schools to bring back testing requirements for the students. And, and the reason why they did this was because they realized that the students who weren't submitting their scores, and typically, like, listen, if you have like a 1600 SAT score or 36 AT, ACT score, which is the highest marks, you know, you're going to submit the score. Obviously, you know, it shows that you are very good at taking the standardized tests. And, you know, you need to have, in my opinion, you know, you, you got to be pretty smart to score that well uh, on a test like that. Um, so they were realizing that the kids that weren't submitting these scores were having a very, very hard time doing well in school. And, you know, a bunch of them ended up like dropping out or transferring elsewhere because they couldn't handle the academic course load. And as they started taking a deeper dive into this, um, they realized that there's actually a pretty strong correlation, you know, at MIT and I think at other elite universities, a pretty strong correlation with what your SAT or ACT score is with how well you perform in that school. So in a lot of these schools, you know, kids who were getting in because they didn't have to submit their SAT or ACT score. And, you know, typically, I mean, you know, logic dictates that, you know, you're not going to submit your score if like, you know, you didn't perform as well as like the average, you know, MIT or Harvard or whatever student performs. Um, and you were just, you know, hoping that you're, you'd be able to stand alone on your grades and your extracurricular activities. And of course, some of these kids did make it through and did get admitted into these universities. Um, for the universities to find out that, you know, I don't know the exact percentage, but a lot of them, you know, were having a tough time 
in school. And um, you know, the more that folks looked into this, they saw this correlation between your performance on SAT exams and how well you were going to, you know, succeed in college. And you know, every college wants to admit students that are going to graduate from the college, um, you know, because that's the point. Um, they don't want students transferring out or dropping out for various reasons. Um, but one is that you know it actually impacts their academic ranking. You know, for things like U.S. News and World Report, you know, they look at what percentage of the kids that matriculate graduate. You know, there's all these like the random statistics that they look at. So MIT was one of the first schools to say, hey, you know what? You need to um, submit your scores again. You know, I think they maybe had a year or two where you didn't have to submit and then everyone had to submit. And there was some pushback on that because there was a lot of like, you know, folks that were saying, well, you know, if you do that, you're really kind of discriminating against minorities. You know, there's certain schools, you know, that like, for instance, like the school that my kids go to is a, is a, public school in you know an affluent area of Long Island it's a very highly ranked public school and this is crazy like you know I looked up this number you know I think my wife actually looked it up like a month ago you know the average I'm talking about the average SAT sco score in my daughter's high school and then, you know it's a huge school there's like 400 plus kids in each grade is a 1430 I mean that is I mean I think that's crazy that's like a super high score like when I was in high school if you got a 1430 that was very 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 good score and you're you know, pretty much guaranteed to go to like some Ivy League school or you know some elite college. Um, you know, now things have changed a bit. Um, you know, I think s s kids are scoring higher and, and, and there is some truth to that. You know, kids who are living in you know, affluent communities have more resources. You know, many of these kids, you know, including my daughter, take courses or have tutors, et cetera, you know, just have access to resources that, you know, a lot of kids don't have. And, you know, just simply by having access to those resources, the school provides resources, you know, our taxpayer dollars, our local taxes go to provide these resources. And, you know, the school, the kids just have a leg up and they perform better on a standardized test. But going back to MIT, interestingly enough, um, so MIT was getting some pushback and folks were saying, hey, you know, you're not gonna be able to have a diverse class if you're gonna use the scores to, you know, dictate who gets into the college, et cetera. And now they're not only using scores, obviously they're using scores and grades and extracurricular activities and awards and all that sort of stuff. But interestingly enough, MIT admitted its most diverse class last year. You know, they had a huge number of minorities, a huge number of, you know, socioeconomically challenged folks that got Pell Grants to go to MIT. And it was like, you know, incredibly diverse class. And they were using scores, grades, and extracurriculars. Uh, and, you know, the, what I was just mentioning, you know, the kids who grow up in privileged areas tend to do better on these standardized exams. But there's ways to control for that, you know. So, you know, what MIT did was, hey, you know what, maybe um, a 1,200 in, like, in, in a poorly performing, like, inner city school, a, ch a kid who gets a score of 1,200, that's the equivalent of getting, like, a 1,400 in, like, you know, some, you know, affluent public school or even private school like Long Island, New York City. I don't know exactly what the correlation is, but obviously... MIT, they're very, very good at math, and they figured out some kind of calculation to account for, you know, those sorts of disparities and, like, the caliber of the high school and the SAT score and that sort of thing. And by doing so, they were able to admit an incredibly diverse class, and the kids that they admit have a very, very high chance of succeeding in graduating from MIT because MIT is, you know, using standardized test scores as part of its barometer to dictate who they think can, you know, perform well, handle the academic course load at MIT, which I'm sure is very, very difficult, and make it through to the finish line. So it had me thinking a lot just about standardized testing in general. And, um, you, you know, it's, there's a ton of great inflation. I mean, you read all these articles about like how all these kids from like all, every school have like straight A averages of, you know, 4.1, 4.2 weighted GPAs. And it really is very hard to distinguish, you know, between like, you know, kid A and kid B who have like, you know, straight A's. But one of the ways you can distinguish them and kind of like, you know, make a somewhat of an objective comparison is by using standardized test scores. And, you know, I think they are a very, very important part of any admissions process. You know, there should be some kind of minimum standard to, you know, get just to get into Harvard or MIT or, you know, one of these elite institutions where the kids there are very, very smart. The academic course load is very, very challenging. And there has to be some kind of way to you know, evaluate who could perform well at that high level. You know, it's the same thing with like, you know, medical school, you know, there's an entrance exam for medical school. So of course everyone takes, you know, the organic chemistry and chemistry and physics and all the classes that you take to get a medical school. Um, but you know, if you, it's probably, again, I, I'm assuming it's a lot harder 
to get straight A's in organic chemistry at like MIT and all the pre-med classes that it is at like, you know, a, you know, a, a less um, prestigious institution, let's just say, you know, like the local college down the street from me. Um, it's probably easier to get straight A's there than it is MIT. Now, I, I think objectively speaking, most folks would agree with that statement. Um, so the way that you can compare an MIT student to like, you know, someone who goes to one of the local, you know, community, like not community college, but local four-year universities is you compare their standardized test score. So, you know, if someone is, has like straight A's at MIT, but did very poorly on the medical college admissions test, um, and someone who has, you know, ver very good grades at a smaller, you know, lesser known institution, but does very well on the medical college admissions test, you can say, hey, you know what, this kid who did well in the MCAT has a good chance of performing well in medical school and getting to the end, um, and probably even a better chance than the kid who had straight A's at MIT and did poorly on the, on the medical school admissions exam. Now, this is not everybody. Some folks are not great at taking um, standardized tests. You know, they're very high pressure tests, and some folks just kind of crumble under that pressure. But part of being a doctor is, you know, performing well under pressure. It's not to say that someone that does poorly on the MCAT would not be a great doctor, but I think you, you know, there is some validity in saying someone who has very good grades, does well in the MCAT, has a good ch chance of performing well in medical school and will make it to the end and has like the foundation for learning the material that will make you a good doctor and enable you to you know, provide value as a doctor in society. Now, going back to this UCLA thing, now, again, this article was like very, very, uh, from a very, very conservative news source. Um, and, um, you know, basically what the article was saying was like, a lot of the kids that have that have been admitted into the UCLA Medical School in the last few years are performing very poorly um, on their board exams, and they're performing very poorly on their clinical rotations. And it was basically like knocking UCLA for not using rigorous entrance requirements. Um, you know, and really they're saying, you know, rather their their primary goal was admitting a very very diverse class rather than admitting a, an academically um, strong class and like i said with the mit example there's actually ways to accomplish both you can have diversity which is very important um, but you can also maintain your academic standard and have a diverse class so this article was basically saying that ucla was not doing that you know the, and new york times article was saying mit found a way to do that um, but you know i i do agree with MIT's strategy you know like if someone is going to be like an airline pilot it's a very very hard thing to do you know you're flying you have hundreds of people's lives in your hands you know there should be some kind of a minimum requirement that's you know like okay I feel safe with this plane you know this pilot went through whatever rigorous course load he or she had to take and you know is capable of getting me from point A to point B safely and you know that's the only thing I really care about if someone if I'm on the operating table you know, I don't care who you are. I just want to make sure that you know what you're doing, that you're going to be able to take care of me or my loved one, that you you know did everything you needed to do to get into medical school, that there was no like special you know consideration made in your application. You know, you were academically gifted enough to get into medical school. You did all everything you needed to do. You dotted your eyes, you crossed your t's, you did well in your board exam, you got through residency, you passed your boards, you're board certified. All of those those things are very very important when you're choosing a doctor. And I'm sure that you would agree with that statement. So um, it is a very, very controversial topic. Uh, and I do see both sides of this. But I, I do think it, it's important in society, particularly in jobs where other people's lives are on the line, where you're, you know, you're taking care of folks and they're depending on you, that there is some minimum standard that's met. And, you know, unfortunately, one of the ways to do that and to compare folks when they're applying to get into like, you know, prestigious universities or medical school or dental school or nursing school or, or wherever it may be, you know, grades are important, but, you know, grades are also very, very subjective. And, you know, a straight A's in one school might mean a totally different than straight A's at a harder school. Um, but standardized tests provide an objective measure of, you know, okay, you know, the, these folks have similar standardized test scores or they have similar grades. And then you can make a decision based on like, okay, you know, I think it's very important that, and I do think it's very important to have diversity um, in all schooling, you know, whether it be, you know, racial diversity or socioeconomic diversity, it's all important. And, um, you know, based on what I'm reading, I think MIT has figured it out and is doing a very good job at, you know, really admitting a very high level, high quality, diverse class. And it's something that I think a lot of institutions can learn from. So with that, 
I hope you all have a wonderful, restful weekend, that you're enjoying the beginning of June, um, that the sun is shining upon you with sunscreen on, of course, and uh, that you're just ready to recharge or and just crush the week ahead. Let's get it. Thank you.